Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Perfect. Can I ask you all to stand to your feet and we'll worship the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Put our hands together. Good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Sing it out, church. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. The people from every nation. From every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Welcome back for another Sunday, and uh, let's pray before we go to the Word of God. Father, we thank you for moments in your presence, O oh God, because those moments are precious. Father, I pray that those moments will translate, O oh God, into greater moments of change, greater moments of ministry, greater moments, O oh, oh God, where, whereby your servant, O oh God, can influence and touch lives, O oh God. And I pray, O oh God, that in your own time, O oh God, you'll make everything beautiful, you will bless, and that you will cont continue, O oh God, to pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. In the final segment of our series on time, I want to talk about God's time. And with that specifically, I want to talk about the fullness of time. God's time the fullness of time. There's a scripture in Galatians 4.4 4 that says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Often we use this scripture only during Christmas about the, the exact full time. More than just Kairos time, but the appointed time. A time set in eternity. A time that broke into human history that was set in our calendar that in the fullness of time something happened something broke through and something broke down the darkness and the evil that was in this world so in god's time god fulfills his appointed plans and this is a different kind of time it's, it's much more than kairos time kairos time requires us to work with god in God's appointed time, God alone in His sovereignty, in the fullness of time, He acts. You know, in many ways, He doesn't really need us. He can do it with His own power, His own strength. Of course, you know, He uses human beings because it has to do with us. It has to do with humans, flawed, imperfect humans. But in God's time, God is sovereign. And um, so we want to look at that. In God's time, when we talk about God's time, it is when God transcends time and space. It's those moments in history where God says, I'm going to step into the history of mankind. I'm going to literally put a bookmark there. I'm going to do something so different that the whole world will be transformed. And really, you know, when you talk about the fullness of time, God sent His Son. For the longest time, our world's calendar was set on B.C. and A.D., right? And what was the, the, the point of the market? It was the point where Jesus was born, the fullness of time. So much so that it affected our calendars, the Gregorian calendar and then the modern calendar. Of course, today they're trying to change it, right? B.C.E. and, um, you know. But it's when God transcends time and space and life and things are changed forever. You see, in a sense, it is impossible to understand God's time in light of the knowledge that time is a construct of His creation so that we can relate to Him. What do I mean that time is a construct of His creation? You see, God is eternal. God is not controlled by time. He's not controlled by time, by space. You know, He is. He just, he just exists. He just functions. Not based on the clock, not based on any realm. And that's where in the Psalms, in Psalm 90 verse 4, it says, For a thousand years in your sight is like a day, that has gone by, or like, like a watch in the night. You know, the psalm is trying to help us to understand that God is not like us when it comes to time, to chronos time. And because we cannot understand that, it is impossible to understand God and the timing of God and God's time. And uh, so, of course, you know, John, in, in John 4, 20, he says, God is spirit. And those who worship, worship in spirit and truth, right? Uh, so, if God is spirit, then He's not controlled, He's not marked by time. 
So how and what is his relationship to time then? You know, how, how does God even function and relate to us? If he's not controlled and marked by time, he can zoom in to our past, our present, our future. He's everywhere. So that's where God's time and God's appointed time for events is, is a mystery. It's a sovereign act of God. The eternity of God is contrasted with the mortality of man. Because God is eternal. I mean, like, how do you mark time? Uh, our lives are short, our frail, you know. The marking of time is irrelevant to God because He transcends it. He transcends it. You know, it, it, He's not controlled by it. He can move it. He, can, he created it more for us than for Himself. And the Lord does not count time as we do. Psalm says 1,000 years, one day in the sight of the Lord. And that's just even uh, an anthropomorphic way of explaining it so that we can understand it, you know. And perhaps it's not even a, a second. It's not even a microsecond with God when a thousand years have passed. Second thing is that God created time to connect the eternal with the temporal. If for anything, if you want to look at time, it is because God has to connect him and us. And the only way to do it is because God created us in a dimensional, three-dimensional world. There's space and there has time. So he has to work within the timing of men. And he has to step into the timing of men. Again, it's a mystery how, you know, and, and why God does that. God created time for us, but he transcends time to be with us. And that's why it's a big thing when the Bible says that, that in the fullness of time, God sent his son because Jesus is deity. Jesus is, a, is, is, is part of the Trinity. He's God, but a God that's not bound by time, by space, by anything, and, and all of a sudden, he gets born and he restricts himself and he binds himself to the timing of man. What love? I mean, the love of God that he would literally handcuff himself with time so that he can spend time with you and I. I mean, it's amazing if we can understand that part. So he created time for us to be with us. Time was simply created by God as part of his creation for accommodating the workings of his purpose. God created the world, uh, world and he, he created time so that things can work out for his purpose, so that there can be a timeline, there can be a plan, there can be a salvation plan, there can be the plan of God for his children in this disposable universe. And whether we like it or not, this universe is not eternal. It is disposable. It is finite. Second Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens and will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, disposable. But God created time. He gives us time in His mercy. But I think one of the most important truths is this, that if you cannot catch this part, then we cannot fully appreciate the Sabbath. We cannot fully appreciate some of the things that God requires from us. God has set certain days, time, in the calendar, more important than other days. Do you realize that? Is it six days you work the seventh, you rest. Six days you work the seventh, you keep as your Sabbath, you honor the Sabbath, you honor the Lord, you worship Him, the Sabbath commandment, Exodus 20, six days you shall labor, do work, the seventh is the Sabbath. You don't do work, the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. He blessed. He made it different. He hallowed it. I mean, the same word says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Do you know the name of the Lord has the same status as the Sabbath? And that's where if you are a Christian and you're not keeping the Sabbath, well, let me say this. It's very important. Jesus became man. He restricted and he handcuffed himself in time so that he can relate to us, so that he can love us, so that he can die for us. All he's asking us to do is let's honor him. 
and let's realize and give him that which is important. So the Sabbath commandment is one of those things that the Bible, God requires us. He commands it. The other thing is in the life of Israel, there are the three annual pilgrimage festivals in Israel. Three times a year, he says, you are to celebrate a festival to me. Why? I mean, it is God's time. God is saying, I have given you a lifetime. All I'm required is one day out of seven. All I'm required of you, Israel, my people, three times a year, you travel, you make a pilgrimage for these three feasts. The first feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover. The second feast is the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. The third feast is the Feast of Booths, to celebrate the 40 days. Basically saying, hey, that's God's time. That's God's moment. That's when God requires you to move away from what you're doing regularly, to travel, to take steps, to honour that it is God's time. It's God's time. You see, there are three reasons God gave concerning the, biblical, the keeping of the biblical festival. One is to remember a past God event. A past God event. Passover, Pentecost, 40 years in the wilderness. Two, to see God working in the lives of His people today. How? You keep the Sabbath. How? You keep the festivals and you celebrate and you hear the testimonies of what God is doing. That's God's time. Three, to paint a picture of future events. So if you think about it, the celebration of festival has to do with the past, to do with the present, and to do with the future. It's about God's time in the past, God's time right now, your Sabbath, your meeting with God, God's time in the future events where God will move and God will call everything in. Matthew 24 says, He will send out His angels with a great shofar and they will gather together His chosen people from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so we see that in the fullness of time. And that's important for us to understand. God's time is marked by divine events in the history of mankind. Ecclesiastes 3, 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He has set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. In God's time, He talks about the future, He talks about the present, and He talks about the, he talks about past, present, and the future. Eternity. And that's where there's a void in our heart to know that God's time is set. There's an appointed time where time will come to an end and God's time will begin where God and men will not be separated by time or space. So God's time are those moments in human history when God intervenes. God interacts in the affairs of mankind to bring about change, transformation, and salvation. We see that in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. There are two, two references to that phrase, fullness of time. The word fullness is from the Greek word pleroma, meaning a filling up. It's like you fill up a jar of water, and you fill it, and you fill it, and when it gets to the top, that's full. So basically, God has like a time capsule, or like the sand in an hourglass, where when you turn it and it fills up, it's an appointed time. In the fullness of time, God has a set time for salvation, for His intervention in the lives of mankind. So the first usage has to do with what happened in the past. It has really happened. Galatians 4, 4. I say to you that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all, but under guardians and stewards, under the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we who were children were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those that were under the law. Fullness of time, the first act was when Jesus came in the fullness of time. He says, I'm going to complete the work, work of salvation. I'm going to step into the timeline of humanity. I'm going to step into the history of mankind and I'm going to mess with the mess that man has created. And he saved us. 
The fullness of time reverse is something that is complete and fully developed. It's complete. God had put everything in place, people in place for hundreds and thousands of years, and now everything has all grown, and now everything is ready for Jesus. Like an apple that has budded, grown, and ripened until it's ready to be picked at the fullness of time. Likewise, sovereignly, God put everything in the right place in the right time, and if you follow the genealogy, how God, all the way from Adam, God connects it to, to Jesus. The coming of the Son of God to this world happened entirely according to God's perfect timing. God's time is His perfect timing. From the very beginning, God promised to send a seed after Adam and Eve. We call it the Protevangelium in Genesis 3.15. It says, I will put enmity between Satan and the woman and between the seed and her seed, it shall, he shall bruise her head and he shall bruise his heel. Way back from the fall of man, God had already said, I'm going to send a son. So God had already put it in man's timeline, in, in the calendar of historical events, Jesus is coming and he knew the exact appointed day, God's time. But he had built everything up to that point. And so this was God's appointed time for the salvation plan to be completed. The word time is translated chronos, not kairos. This was exactly in the clock, in the second, in the minute, in the day, in the hour, God has set it in time. Fullness of time. For centuries, the time had been in preparation and various society elements had contributed to it. Think about it. The time was perfect. Fullness of time. Everything was ready. Three things. The Jews with their concept of monotheism and the Old Testament scriptures, with scores of pro prophecies regarding Messiah, had prepared the way. The Jews had already prepared. As imperfect as they were, they were expecting a Messiah. They were ready for a Messiah. Two, the Greeks had provided a language that was the most precise instrument for the conveyance of human thought the world had ever known. In other words, it was a common language. Before that, it was everybody speaking their own language. And, and then, of course, the Greeks through their coiny Greek, everybody spoke the same language. Everybody understood it. Everybody could communicate. It was ready for the gospel to spread. Third, the Romans had given hu humanity a time of peace and marvelous transportation and communication system. The Romans had conquered the, the, the known world at that time. And the Romans had given a system of governance where travel and everything was controlled. And even though they were against the work of Jesus, you see, God had used them in His plan. So much so that everything was ready. The transportation, the roads, so that when the gospel was ready to be preached, Paul could go. Mark could go. Thomas could go all, could go all the way to India. I mean, everything was set in the fullness of time. Think about it. It's not a coincidence. God's time is perfect time for everything. So the perfect culmination of God's plan of salvation. And then, of course, the second application, you see, of the phrase, in the fullness of time, is at the end of time. In the fullness of time that he might gather together. This is the second usage of the phrase, in the fullness of time, and this has to do with what will happen in the future. While the first has to do with what has happened in the past through the, through the birth, life, and death of Jesus, this has to do with the culmination of time. Where Time will come to an end after that. In Ephesians 1 says is that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and that which is on earth in him. I just taught an entire series on end times. And I talked about the last great trumpet where God will rapture us and call us up. And then, of course, eventually he'll come in and he will close everything. He will shut everything down. He will burn up and renovate this earth because it's all messed up. It's all destroyed by the sins of men. The culmination of God's plan is resurrection. He says, according to his good pleasure, that in the dispensation of fullness, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and that which is on earth. What does that mean? 
In other words, heaven and earth will no longer be separate. The spiritual, the eternal will be connected. There will no longer be the mortal. There will no longer be the earth and things that will break down because God will bring everything together and everything will be resurrected and be renewed. It's called the day of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians it says, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together by Him, which is the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Paul had to remind the Thessalonians about the chronological order of the day of the Lord. He says, let no one deceive you. You know, the day is coming. But you will know when it comes. And that's where in Romans 13, 11, it says, this is the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Tick, tock, tick, tock. It's running out. And when Jesus comes, time will be no more. See, some people are complaining, Jesus, why aren't you coming sooner than that? The truth is this, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but He wants everyone to repent. He wants all to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. The fullness of time, Jesus came to save. The fullness of time, He will come again, and He will close up, and He will close out. Time, space, the mortal, the transient world, the final event in God's time will close the timeline of this created universe. And from then on, time will be no more. Time will be no more. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have your time, O oh God, and your time is perfect. In your time, all things are beautiful, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, that in your time, in the fullness of time, you send Jesus and we are saved. Lord, I pray even right now that you prepare us for the second fullness of time when you will come again. Lord, I pray that we will use our Kairos moments to redeem, to save, that we use our seasons to prepare, that we will mark time right now as urgent so that we will do all it takes that none will perish without Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.